live on YouTube and UGTV will start in about a minute. All right, live on YouTube TV. Good afternoon. Before I call the meeting to order, I want to announce that due to COVID-19, we have individuals attending remotely all participants joining by phone should mute their phones when not speaking to avoid background noise. During the meeting, please make sure that you announce yourself by name and title every time you speak so the public that is participating knows who is speaking. This is critical given the number of remote participants and is current guidance from the Kansas Attorney General. I call the meeting to order to announce the meeting and call the roll. A special session is being held on Thursday, August the 27th, 2020 at 5 o'clock p.m. for a COVID-19 update and the Central Avenue Master Plan. Roll call. Burroughs? Aye. Townsend? Here. <laughs> Here. McKiernan? Here. Ramirez? Here. Johnson? Kane? Here. Markley? Here. Walters? Here. Philbrook? Here. Bynum? Here. Alvey? Here. All right. Tonight we have an update regarding COVID 19 and the Central Avenue Master Plan. I'll turn it over to Mr. Bach. Thank you, Mayor. Commissioners, as noted tonight, um, and as we have done for the past five months, we come forward to the governing body, provide an update where we're at with COVID-19, um, our numbers in the community and the impacts this is having. Um, we also wanted to provide some additional update tonight regarding um, activities in the commission committee as we're looking at different orders that are out there, but it is clear there's no new order that we are issuing to the community. Um, nothing like that is intended tonight, nor was planned to come forward to the governing body. We would like to go through and talk about the situation that's going on in our community. And then if there were any necessary changes in the future, those would be ones that would come at a, at a later date. Um, with that, I'm going to turn this over to Julianne Van Lu, our Director of the Health Department, and Dr. Streiners and Corvo, who will be offering presentation this evening. Julianne? Thanks, Doug. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Commissioners, for having us back once again for a COVID update. Tonight, uh, we're gonna be pretty data heavy, so we have a robust presentation for you with up-to-date information on our cases, deaths, and hospitalization, as well as testing, and, and as Doug alluded to, um, just some, some additional conversation about sports and youth activities. Dr. Greiner is actually gonna get us started tonight uh, covering cases and deaths uh, and the current situation. Great, thank you, Julianne. Again, Alan Greiner here with Dr. Corvo. Um, this first slide shows how we're doing in terms of our case rate. You can see the uh, red or red square there that, that we're still double the KCMO um, infection rate, twice the rate in the state of Kansas and, and three times the rate in Johnson County. We don't think that our rate is inflated because of more testing. Actually, KCMO is the only metro county that's doing more testing than we are. But again, our rate is significantly higher. Um, Next slide. Also compared to the, the state of Kansas, why not of course makes up only 5% of the Kansas total population, but we have 14% of the total cases in the state and 26% of the total deaths. So that's, that's all pretty disproportionate. Next slide. For our testing in the county, how many cases are we seeing per day? We're seeing approximately 45 now on a seven day rolling average. That's an improvement and we'll show you a graph that shows that in a minute. The death rate is, is relatively low uh, compared to where it was, less than a half of a, a, a person dying each day. The 
percent positivity rate though remains extremely high. This is, this is one of our major concerns and we'll show you some other data about this. At the health department itself, our, our positivity rate of testing um, is 27% of all the tests we've done over, over the course of the pandemic. And in fact, it's going up in the last uh, week to two weeks. The, the last three days, the, the test positivity rate here at the health department has been 34%. Next slide. On our, um, again, on our uh, rolling average of new cases, over there on the far right, you can see that, that we're at about uh, 45 new cases per day. That's actually about where we were at, at the peak of the stay at home order back there where you see the 44 on the left hand side. We've come, we've come down a lot um, and, and that's really positive. We think most of that decline that we've seen since middle of July is, is related to the mask order. So this is one of those things we're always learning new information and it, and it really is a struggle I think for everyone to, to try to anticipate what we should be doing next. You can see stay at home order worked on the left. We got a huge decline in cases and wearing masks has really worked as well. And next slide. Yeah, so this just highlights how we're back basically where we were at the peak uh, during the stay at home order. Next slide. Yeah, so this shows that we know COVID-19 is most, most deadly for older adults, but it's not, it's exclusively deadly in, in, in the elderly. We've got about one out of five of the cases um, of mortality affecting folks that are under the age of 60. Uh, and we'll show you some more data from KU here in a minute. Next slide. This is um, KU Med Center data. And, and you can see again, what, what I think this really points out is that the high numbers of deaths we had on the left there, we implemented the stay at home order. It made a dramatic impact on that. Um, there was almost a month long period at, at KU Med where there, there were virtually no deaths. And that's really changed in the, in the last month um, to six weeks. You can see that there's those higher numbers. Now that's a small number per day per se, but, but changing from stay at home order to where we are now has, has made a difference. Hopefully the mask mandate, we, we don't see its effect probably till even later. So we might get a, a further decline in deaths um, with the mask order. Next slide. And, and we apologize for the way the, the bottom looks on here. We got this data from, from KU Med and, and their, their computer program spits this out in a sort of odd way. But what we wanna highlight is that in March and April, most of the deaths were in the 60, 70, 80, and 90 year old age groups. Um, you can see those percentages there. Next slide. But here in July and August with the, with the deaths that are occurring, a, a larger percentage of those are in, uh, happening in 20 year olds, 50 year olds, 40 year olds. We still got some occurring in 70 and eight, 60 and 70 and 80 year olds, but there's a little bit less of that. And, and we wonder whether whether older adults have actually changed their behavior better than some of our other population demographics. Next slide. Oh, I think I'm kicking it to Julianne now to talk about testing, I believe. Thanks, Dr. Greiner. We just wanna give you a little update on how testing is going in the health department as well as in the county. One thing we wanna make sure we make clear this evening for our commissioners and our community uh, is that the Centers for Disease Control, um, CDC, within the last couple of days has uh, issued new guidelines um, against testing close contacts of positive cases. Uh, we believe this is largely politically motivated and this is not something that the Unified Government Public Health Department will be adopting. So we will continue as we have done uh, to test close contacts of positive cases. That's obviously the clearest way to know who's, who is positive from that initial case uh, and to do the contact tracing and hopefully break the, train, the chain of transmission. We have made a slight change uh, to the way we do things uh, in our testing. Previously, if you were a close contact to a positive case, we asked you to come in to be tested five to seven days from exposure. Uh, as everything, we continue to evaluate the most up-to-date research and science, and what has come out in the last couple of weeks has shown that we actually need to push, push that back a little bit. So we do invite people who are contacts of positive cases to come in for testing at the health department. We ask them to do that days seven to nine from exposure. Uh, that that's when we get the best chance of, find, of identifying those positive cases. Uh, 
many of you know, we've been uh, working on validating saliva testing. Uh, we are hoping to finish this up within the next couple of weeks. It's taken significantly longer than we had hoped. Uh, but, but if that validation goes as well as we think it's going, uh, we will be transitioning to doing that mode of testing, moving away from that fairly painful nasopharyngeal swab, uh, which is our method right now. So more to come in coming weeks, but we're hopeful uh, that certainly is a, a much more comfortable test for our residents. As always, just a reminder, uh, folks can get tested at the health department for free if they live or work in Wyandotte County, Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Wanted to show a little bit of a comparison on, in how well we are testing our community. You can see here, and I pulled this from the MARC hub that they launched a few weeks ago, that Wyandotte County is second only to Kansas City, Missouri in the total test per 100,000 population. Um, th this is a great, this is really great. <laughs> it means that we are testing uh, as probably as well as we can. We could always do more, uh, but the more we test, the more cases we can find and isolate and quarantine, and again, break that chain of transmission. So uh, very proud of, of how our community has stepped up, not just in the health department, but the many pop-up test sites that are going on uh, is showing that we are making an impact here when it comes to testing. However, given that, we are seeing a bit of a decrease in testing. So uh, in the last few weeks, I think some of you already know this, um, the, the health department's testing uh, on a day, each day uh, has significantly come down. So we're now testing on average about 65 folks a day, uh, significantly lower than five or six weeks ago. Uh, across the county, we're also seeing a decline, not quite as steep, uh, but it certainly has come down in recent weeks. Across the county, uh, our seven day rolling average for number of tests that are being conducted uh, is just shy of 400. So we continue to try to figure out, um, you know, what's really the cause, the root cause of this reduction in testing. Is it people experiencing fewer symptoms? Are there other barriers? So uh, we continue to work with our health equity task force and other partners to make sure we're hearing what's what's being said on the ground and, and make sure that we're um, aware of any of those additional barriers that people are facing or reasons why people aren't coming for testing. It's an involving and continuing conversation. Across the county, uh, our seven day rolling average for percent positivity. Again, this is the percent of tests that come back positive out of all the tests that are conducted. We've really hovered uh, around this 20% range for the last many weeks. Uh, we're sitting today around 18% positivity. This is quite high if you compare it to other jurisdictions uh, within the Metro and, and across Kansas as well. Um, this is for symptomatic and asymptomatic testing. So I think there's some conception that our um, percent positivity is significantly higher purely because we do not do asymptomatic testing in Wyandotte and that's not entirely true. So we do asymptomatic testing at the health department and pop-up sites for contacts of positive cases. There's also a significant amount of asymptomatic testing that happens in our medical facilities, especially uh, KU, our largest medical provider. Uh, so it is sy symptomatic and asymptomatic percent positivity and remains very high. Again, what we're showing here and what Dr. Greiner showed a little earlier, we're really trying to make sure that we are learning lessons from the decisions that we're making. So we're trying to find differences uh, before and after we make decisions. So you can see here in the left box, um, testing symptomatic folks only. That's what we did at the very beginning of the outbreak at the health department. We really just tried to focus in on those folks who were experiencing symptoms. This was back in March and April before we knew a lot about COVID, a lot that we know now. Um, we transitioned uh, in May to test, testing symptomatic folks and asymptomatic folks who had been exposed. And you can see our, our rate went down and then it has slowly climbed back up. Um, so again, we're seeing that high percent positivity and that is one of the reasons that, that, um, that worries us about school reopening and, and about a lot of the activities that are happening in our community. I'm gonna shift here and send it over to Dr. Aaron Corvo who's gonna speak to hospitalizations. Thank you, Julianne. Um, yeah, I wanted to highlight some data, again, that is out of our largest um, medical uh, provider, KU um, Hospital, this evening. Um, as you can see uh, up at the top there, um, with, uh, you know, going from April to May, June, July, and August, um, that you can see um, COVID-positive patients uh, admitted to the hospital is certainly increasing. Uh, next slide. Um, I wanted to um, also bring everybody's attention to um, the fact that every day we're getting our numbers from our uh, hospitals around 
uh, in the community. Um, today, um, KU Hospital reported that they've got 27 positive COVID patients in the hospital. And actually, this is a, sort of a case of comparing apples and oranges. Not all of the hospitals report their data the same way. So um, at KU, uh, the COVID positive um, patients that they report are those that are still on isolation. So within that first 10 days of their infection, um, but that is not the total number of people in the hospital that have COVID. So we actually have 61 patients at this time at, at KU Hospital. Next slide. I also wanted to uh, show some more data here, a very interesting trend that's occurred um, from early in the pandemic to um, later in the pandemic. So you can see um, here in the blue bars, um, which represents March and April. And underneath um, there at the bottom of the grass, graph, you can see various um, comorbidities or, or conditions, uh, underlying health condi conditions that, that people have uh, who may be uh, admitted to the hospital with COVID. Interestingly, in March and April, with the blue bars um, all the way over to the right, you can see when people have no underlying conditions, it was very rare that they were admitted to the hospital. However, the red bars now, as we look into July and August, show that uh, you know, the number of people admitted to the hospital with no conditions is actually increasing. So this is actually a really very concerning trend to us here in the health department. Next slide. I want to talk a bit this evening uh, about education. Um, we're having some of our uh, some some concerns around this in the community, as as many of you have have heard about. Um, the first uh, um, graphic here um, just shows that um, our youth, age uh, um, zero to nineteen years, make up about uh, almost fifteen percent of of all COVID positive uh, cases within Wyandotte County. And we compare that with um, people ages uh, 60 and older who make up about 14.4% um, of the cases. Next slide. Um, just wanna make the point here as well. Um, there is a, we're finding a, again, a disproportionate impact on our um, Hispanic or Latinx um, youth. As you can see here on the, the left side, we're seeing uh, in our youth um, that um, uh, over 65% of our cases um, uh, identify as white. And on the right side here, you can see as ethnicity um, that our uh, Hispanic ethnicity is representing, unfortunately, a very large uh, percentage of our cases. Next slide. Um, one of the reasons that uh, we're very concerned, you know, you may hear, well, our kids get the, the, the disease, but they're not getting that sick and they're not dying uh, from the disease. We do, however, have really significant concerns about kids getting the disease because we're starting to um, find that there are long-term effects, um, uh, especially on um, children's cardiovascular health uh, going um, forward. Um, we're seeing that also in um, sort of the, their parents' age, um, sort of into the um, 30s, 40s, and 50s. I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Greiner as well. There's been some really interesting research on this and we really wanna hammer home why we're still trying to prevent uh, you know, young people from getting this disease. It's just not safe for anybody to get it. Thanks, Dr. Corvo. And, and we don't have another graph for you, but, but we've been talking a lot about a, a study that came out of Germany that was published earlier this month that showed in a, in a group of 100 individuals who were approximately four months out from, from their infection with COVID-19. And this was a group of of 40 to 60 year old um, adult males in Germany, four months out from their infection with COVID, they did cardiac MRIs on those patients. We, we generally don't do MRIs on the heart because it shows us a ton of detail and we usually don't even need that much detail to look at hearts. But it, because it gives you that much detail, you can see really what's going on with, with the individual muscle areas of the heart very well. They found that 78 out of 100 of those patients had persistent cardiac muscle motion deficits. So that's a, that's a staggeringly high number for people um, uh, recovering from a viral illness. We know this virus does attack the heart in some patients very significantly. Um, it, some patients can go into fluid heart failure, but, but having persistent um, cardiac issues is something that, that we worry about. And one of the reasons why it may look like at times we are overreacting to various things. Um, in talking to, to some of our other staff here internally, we are, we are 
constantly trying to walk a fine line between trying to be extremely cautious and use the science and, and data we know we have to protect everyone, but also allow, allow freedoms, understanding that, that we are probably not going back to a stay-at-home order. Uh, we, we have to let people, hopefully we have to get students back in the classroom safely. We think because of, of some of the methods we've learned about social distancing and, and mask mandates, that we, we can control this even with letting people do much more than we did during the stay at home, stay at home order uh, period. But it's really tough for us walking that fine line and, and trying to work with with all of, all of the all of the, the the individuals like you all in the commission as well as the general public who who all have their their own individual concerns that that are important we just don't want to see a situation where we let activities like in in class schooling start again and and might have a have a a heart issue in some patients down the line that that we feel could have been avoided with care, more careful planning and, and more detailed analysis of, of who's in contact with who. So sorry to go on, on so long. I'll, I'll turn it back over to you, Dr. Corbin. All right, we'll move on here. <laughs> um, we're gonna bring forward this evening some concerns we've got about um, our kids returning back to school. Um, of course, as you know, um, we're, uh, we're just right around the corner from that. So after Labor Day, um, many of our kids, um, except of course for our USD 500, uh, district will be returning for 50% um, capacity in, in class uh, learning. Um, you know, we've been working for a very long time um, throughout the summer months uh, and here recently with our um, county ed uh, educators uh, and our superintendents. And, you know, they've really stated to us um, that their greatest interest and goals for our, for our kids here in, in our county is to get them back to in-person <laughs> Uh, learning and and they've told us uh, in no uncertain terms that that is their highest priority. Um, so we've devised uh, this method along with our educators of really very tightly cohorting our students, and we do this because we want to give our schools the best chance of remaining open. Cohorting students has to do with putting students into very small groups and then keeping those students within those small groups throughout the day so that day in and day out they're returning to the same groups so that if one person gets sick they're not compromising you know the other students that may be part of other cohorts we have become concerned after issuing our previous order regarding sports that many of the activities that were planned for students have moved outside of the county um, and, and so we're bringing forth just some more discussion and, and our concerns to you this evening. We worry that when we allow our students to go elsewhere to compete and then return back to Wyandotte County, that unfortunately we've broken those cohorts and we may be placing our children at risk. Um, so it's not just about the kids, of course. We wanna remind you that their parents uh, and guardians, grandparents, et cetera, are really uh, very at risk as well. We know that these children um, can, can easily spread the virus and, and such. Next slide, Julian. Um, we um, want to also put forth this evening, we, we've been talking with our epidemiology team, we wanna um, put forth for you sort of our plans and when we might close a school. We haven't talked about that um, yet uh, together, um, but, um, you know, we, we plan that if there are um, two separate cohorts within a, a school building that are uh, experiencing clusters of outbreaks, we feel that that would be the appropriate time to, to close a school um, for fear that that spread would become really quite a bit wider. We're also working uh, with KDHE and our schools directly um, to define when we would close a school based on absenteeism. And for now, we're thinking that um, for in-person classes, you know, if, if absenteeism is 10% higher than last year's average, we would consider uh, closing the schools at that time. Next slide. I wanted to um, also let you all know that unfortunately we're seeing um, a, a lot of clusters um, that are coming out of um, sports play in our state. Um, I wanted to highlight for you up above here, uh, unfortunately in our own community, uh, the KCK Volleyball Club team has, has unfortunately had a cluster outbreak associated there. 
And then you can see on down from there, there have been several others. Um, unfortunately, some of them um, pretty large. Some of these sports are contact sports, but then again, not all of them are. And so we also wanted to highlight that, unfortunately, um, these activities are um, um, causing or, or at the root of um, uh, several different outbreaks that are happening uh, currently. Next slide. I wanted to um, finally, before we end uh, and get to questions, just drive home this idea of preserving the cohorts um, so that our kids can get back to in-person learning. Again, that is our greatest goal. Uh, if you'll see there on the left-hand side, um, a mock-up of a school, you can see that the children are, are in their groups, A, B, and C, cohorted. Next slide. When we uh, allow our kids to go out and practice uh, in a team-like setting or have activities together, they may be comprised of different cohorts. And so at that time, those kids would be getting together uh, and, and unfortunately, that's uh, compromising the, the cohort at that point. Next slide. And then additionally, if we were to uh, bus our children outside from the county, outside from areas where they're even doing these really intense cohorting plans, we're really worried actually about the spread of COVID to our kids uh, that are from Wyandotte County. If our kids were to become infected in that setting, next slide, we worry that they would bring the virus back and then it would spread really very quickly throughout the cohorts that we've laid out so carefully within our schools. Next slide. <laughs> this is an extreme close-up of our cohorts. <laughs> this highlights that, um, you know, we, we really, um, we, we can't make the decisions for the other kids in the class, you know, that are trying really hard to cohort. We, we, we just cannot put them at risk. You know, we, we cannot um, uh, say, you know, well, we can, we can go out and, and play and go elsewhere and whatnot, and then compromise those other people who may be trying really hard to stay uh, in, into a cohort and, and stay safe in that way. So we worry that these activities do that. Next slide. The last slide, Dr. Corvo. Great, thanks. So that was our last slide. Um, I'll kick it back to you actually, Julianne, um, and then perhaps we can go for questions. Thank you. Yeah, we can go ahead and open for questions. Okay, I wanna start. <clears throat> Commissioner Mike Kane. Last weekend, there were over 2,000 rafters over at hy uh, Center. All summer long, our kids have been playing baseball, softball, soccer, all outside of Wyandotte County. Two of us commissioners went to the Piper uh, meeting the other day and they agreed to follow all the guidelines that were provided. And, and I was sitting there, I thought, well, that's pretty good. But then the other day, I heard what Dr. Lee Norman said. When asked in his press conference about the youth sports, said the decision would be on each school, would, it, would we have been putting all precautions in place to mitigate the chance of exposure of our kids are happy to be doing what they love. Now, I know that you said that you're, you're, there's no changes coming, but the stuff that you talked about is, is we're already going outside the county. Several of us, I, all, I work in Wyandotte County, but several people that have kids that go to private schools are driving over to Johnson County. The Legends is open. We have all kinds of shoppers there now. The teams have done what they've asked to do a gentleman talked to me a little while ago with the fifth grader said his son wore a mask is 92 degrees outside. He's in fifth grade. When we follow those guidelines, when the school follows those guidelines, I don't know why any rumor would go out there or why we would have a presentation like this. Cause it sounds like you're setting up to shut this stuff down. And I do not like that at all. Something else too, the, the doctor should not be the one that makes the decision. I guess there's something out there that if a decision is made like that, that the commissioners can override the doctor, that I want to see. I, I saw a little bit of it earlier. It's up to us. Our kids want to play ball. They want to play. And, and if any of you go look at the video the other day of the first gentleman that spoke, he shook from the, the top of his head down to the bottom of his shoes, talking about how important it was to him. 
and and all of you have got emails all the last couple of days and it's frustrating for me just now to have a meeting at four o'clock to tell us what you're actually going to talk about but i want to remind everybody that i asked a question on august 13th and then asked a clear question during the meeting about what the medical officers and the mayor would do to those play competition games outside the county the medical officer answered on the video was that they cannot control residents what they do outside the county. That was August 13th in a Zoom meeting. Now all of a sudden, there's a rumor that we're gonna shut down. You guys showed some stuff that you're concerned about. Somebody needs to go out there and watch these kids, pay attention to them talking. And I don't like being on Zoom because the, the chambers would be filled up tonight with not the parents, but the kids that would tell us we really want to do this. And, and they actually feel that it's being dictated. And, and our approach on this is, is not what I like. And, and in my mind, it's not acceptable. And I know we haven't done anything, but before we do anything, we better make sure that everyone knows what's going on and something happened. But we're, they're getting ready to start playing games Friday. And in my mind, we need to give our kids something. We've tied them up for a long time. Everyone wants to go out there and see their kid do something. Everybody wants to get out of the house. And then, but to, to all of a sudden, here we are in District 5. District 5 comes up. The school board did a great job. They got a fantastic new superintendent. Everyone's trying to follow the guidelines. And all of a sudden, there's a rumor out there, well, we're not going to let them. Well, I don't believe it's up to the doctor. The, the, the state doctors already said that, that, it, that, that it's okay. Leave it up to the school districts and we should leave it up to the school districts. I don't want a doctor making a decision for who does, one doesn't live here and it's gonna affect our kids. Thank you, Commissioner Kane. Um, I appreciate those comments. Um, and, and I do believe still that there's there's nothing any of us can do um, to control what folks do outside of this county. Uh, you know, we've been in real close contact with with our legal counsel here with everything we've done. Um, I think a lot of the data we presented, it, to me, some of it boils down to the the real clear evidence we have that that stay at home orders work for reducing spread and reducing hospitalizations and reducing deaths. I think masks do that as well. The data is pretty clear that we're seeing a real major reduction in cases in, in the last month to six weeks with that. I think we're going to see less deaths in, in future weeks because of mass orders, as long as there's no other confounding variable that intervenes uh, to, to increase spread in the coming weeks. I think it was our belief, and, and I believe that, that the mask order that's been in place for some time now um, suggest that if anyone is going to gay, engage in things that put them within six feet of some other person for more than 10 minutes cumulatively over time, they would be wearing masks. And so the combination of masks and social distancing, I think is something that, that we are just trying to promote that because if we think it reduces spread, we think it reduces hospitalizations, we think it saves lives. If, if sports can be conducted in such a way that people can wear masks and social distance, then we think it's going to reduce spread. And we don't think schools will end up having to be closed at, at as fast of a rate as they will if, if we're allowing things to happen in the county. It's my understanding that if a school is going to, to have a, a football game, say, in the state of Kansas, they have to have had 10, 10 practices prior to that, that game. Uh, we, we just weren't aware that, that practices in the county were happening where close contact was occurring between individuals practicing and they were not wearing masks. That's something that was new to us as of exactly one week ago today. Um, and that's where this conversation has, has come from and that's where all this data has come from. So we want to continue this dialogue. And again, we don't want to make a decision now. We want to, we want to have a dialogue about what's safe and, and what it's going to are you, gonna, are you gonna close the legends? Are you gonna quit the uh, uh, Sporting K? Are you gonna stop them from playing soccer? 
This is a big deal. This is huge to the families. And I want everyone to be safe when they're following the guidelines. And all of a sudden, it, it, in my mind, I know that, that they feel out there in, in Piper that this was some sort of threat. And, and nobody likes that. And, and I have never, ever had so many phone calls, so many emails, just here in the last hour, five or six people saying, we can't do this. You know, we're elected to listen to the people. And as long as they follow those guidelines, they should play ball. And again, I think routine and universal mask wearing and routine and universal social distancing is what's gonna get us through this with the, the least health impact. Um, that's all I can say based on my my training and my ability to, to review science. Um, you know, if others if others feel like they've got better expertise in that arena, then then how, how can the the, the 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 state doctor say they let the schools decide, and then then our health department says we're going to decide. I think if you if you if we had the legal team, I don't know if Ken Morzana wants to weigh in on that, but I I think that. That, they, that the legal team's interpretation of that is is that that, that can't work that way. Okay, <laughs> but it, when I talked to Kenny, when I when I talked to Kenny earlier, he said there is it, there is a system in play where the commissioners could vote on this. Yes, can, uh, Mr. Moore. Kenny, are you on the call? Um, I do not see Mr. Darius. Ken? Ken Moore, are you able to hear? Okay, it's, it's not, not working. Uh, we'll come back, try and get that rectified. Uh, Commissioner McKiernan. Thank you, Mayor. I do see that Ken is on. He dropped off for just a moment. Oh, he just dropped off again. So he must be having some connection difficulties. I think Commissioner Kane has hit upon the most crucial piece for all of us as we move forward from today, and that is to keep talking to each other. I think we've got to share in both directions. You know, I see Mr. Moore is back, and so I can suspend my comments and let him take over, although I'm not sure he's unmuted. So, Mr. Moore, if you want to go ahead and talk, I'll uh, come back later. And Ken, we cannot hear you at the moment. So if you are unmuted, then you've got a connection problem. Commissioner McKernan, go ahead. All right. So Ken, I'm gonna go ahead and continue because I see by your graphic that you're unmuted and yet we are not able to hear you. So what, what I want to just emphasize is that what we've done here today is, and we've done it before today, we just need to stay in touch with each other. We just need to keep each other constantly informed and constantly up to date and constantly informed about what's going on. Let's face it, everybody. We have given Dr. Greiner, Dr. Corvo, and Julianne Van Lu an impossible task. We've asked them to keep us healthy and productive and active all at the same time in the face of a virus that frankly doesn't care what we do. So we've got a true pandemic on our hands and we've got to hit the right uh, intermediate point between all of the ways that we could possibly go. And I think the only way we do that is we keep talking to each other. I want to really thank uh, Dr. Greiner, Dr. Corvo, and Ms. Van Lu. I think we owe them a debt of gratitude. 
I think that anybody who's worked with them for any length of time, and I'm going to share this for those of you who haven't done that, anybody who's worked with them knows that these three people care very deeply about all of us in Wyandotte County, and they work really hard to make sure that our community is as healthy as it can be. And it's tough stuff because there is a pandemic here. We need to engage all of each other as allies in this and keep talking and keep refining. One of the things I really like about what they do is they are learning. They're constantly looking at the data and from March 12th until today, they've learned new things. And as they've learned new things, they've shared those with us and they've tried to implement changes in protocols as they've learned uh, those new things. And I think that that's ultimately what's gonna pay off. They pay attention to the data. They are willing to change protocols. They are willing to change regulations in what they believe is gonna be the way that is the most beneficial to all of us. So we've just got to keep in communication with each other, um, keeping us, um, Anyway, I'll just stop it there and say again, I thank you for your continued work. We really owe you a debt of gratitude. And I say that we will all continue to communicate and we will beat this. Mr. Moore? Uh, yes, Mayor, I apologize. I am having some technical difficulties. Um, I guess the question was that, that the legislature in the special session did change the statutes that now allow the uh, the county commissioners to override a local health order, just like they changed the law to make it clear that the county commissioners can override the governor's executive orders. So that, that step is in place. Uh, I still believe that the, uh, the local health orders are a broad application and are all, they're all encompassing throughout the county and are more broad than the uh, uh, school board's powers uh, regarding their operations in, in this regard, in the health regard. I mean, for example, if we have a health emergency, the local health officer can order school closed. Uh, and I think that would override any school board decision not to do so. So those are the two factors that we need to balance and keep in place. Commissioner Ramirez. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, thank you, as always, to Dr. Porvo, Dr. Greiner, um, and Julianne, to the health department. You guys are doing an amazing job for our community. And again, I will repeat, as I said in the in the past, I think Wyandotte is doing the best in taking this on because we're not making it political. We're, we're, we're looking out for our people and our people's health and safety. So thank you for that. Um, Mike, just quick comment. Um, Commissioner McKiernan hit it right on the head. Um, I, I see both sides of this argument, but, the, but then that means we need to have a conversation and find a compromise that works for everybody. Because that, that's the one thing in government that we all have to do is compromise and having an open line of communication. And I just hope that we continue that from, um, for in the future for anything. And I agree with Mc, Doc, or Commissioner McKiernan. If we work together, listen to each other, we can get over this. And we can overcome this and make Wyandotte County better than it was before. Thank you. Commissioner Bynum. Thank you, Mayor. Just had a couple of questions, if possible, on the slides, uh, starting with the information from the actual KU Medical Center and the patients that are there. And my questions are relaying of questions and comments that folks were asking me over these last few days. Um, with regard to KU and the hospitalizations, are we counting those that are Wyandotte? I know that, you know, many people that don't live in Wyandotte 
are hospitalized within KU Hospital. So it looked like one of your graphs had numbers among six and seven and eight people. And then another, I think Dr. Corvo had related 27 in isolation yet actually 61. I would just, if you could spend two seconds clarifying uh, the differences and the way that we're counting hospitalizations here in Wyandotte versus what might be happening at KU. My second question is, again, uh, relaying to you from questions I've been receiving over the last few days, how do we relate to uh, multitudes of other activities that may or may not be happening as we cross the border into Missouri or Leavenworth County or Johnson County, um, you know, folks that work in another community and come home here every night to their families, and especially as it relates to that discussion of the cohort within the classrooms. Um, and lastly, if you could just confirm for me that it's your understanding that all of our educational institutions, I should say at the um, middle and high school level, had stated to you that the cohort was the way that they were planning to do instruction when instruction was taking place in person. But if you could just compare and contrast a little bit the the concerns that you have, particularly around the sports issue, or I should say sports and other activities issues against the other comings and goings in and out of our community and then confirming uh, whether the cohort model is the model that's been chosen by our educators. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Bynum. Um, I can respond to your first question um, regarding the graphs um, that were uh, referring to the KU um, hospitalized patients. Um, I, I appreciate that question. Those were of all the um, patients uh, hospitalized there, not necessarily only Wyandotte County residents that were hospitalized there. Um, it seems to me over the course of this time, approximately a third to a half of the patients at KU are generally from Wyandotte County, although I, would, I could get you those more specific uh, numbers. I was really trying to just make the point that um, there are actually quite a bit more uh, or quite a bit higher number uh, that, that are hospitalized there with uh, COVID and still being treated for COVID than the numbers that we're often hearing. Um, I'll then skip to the, um, the, well, actually I'll turn it to Dr. Greiner and let him speak it to the second question yeah. that you, you asked. I think the second question I think was getting at, you know, what about people going elsewhere and, and doing activities and, and, and doing various things and, and then coming back, coming back to Wyandotte County where they reside. And, and it, of course that's a big concern to us. And, and I think that as, as Mr. Ramirez said, I think that there is some, there's some evidence, which we didn't present much of today, that, that in this county, we've actually done a better job with a lot of things over the past five to six months than, than other counties. Um, you know, if you look at the Johnson County data today, it's, it's on the upswing. Um, and, and we hope that if people are going outside of our county, engaging in activities, they are prioritizing those two big interventions that I keep harping on, which is that that's wearing masks, and, and social distancing when they're doing those activities. Um, if, if people are doing that, that even if they're in a place where things are less restrictive, they're, they're still protecting themselves and they're less likely to bring it back. And, and I think our, our concern is whenever we identify something that's happening that, you know, that might involve no masks and no social distancing, um, how, can we, how can we mitigate spread when it relates to that? So we, we're aware that people are doing things all over the metro uh, and interacting with, with folks in different ways in different settings. Um, but, but we hope they're being careful and we wanna keep pushing that message of, of being careful and, and trying to structure what we can you know, to reduce those episodes where transmission occurs. So mm -hmm. now you get the cohort now question. Now I'll get the cohort question <laughs> um, regarding um, the question of uh, if we had talked with our um, various educators um, uh, Yes, I'm, we have been in close um, 
conversation with our, our superintendents um, and also the archdiocese um, throughout this um, pandemic. And, and really very early on, you know, we, we, once we started thinking about reopening the county, we very quickly got together um, a very large group of educators um, that then was divided into early education and, and school age kids and then higher education and worked together for a long time. Most recently, um, as we've returned to this um, issue of school reopening and we're getting closer and closer, we've been working especially hard with our uh, with all of our superintendents and also the archdiocese. Um, we had talked uh, a lot about cohorting and each of them have submitted plans to us about their school reopenings. And they had agreed that uh, cohorting was uh, a good way to go. And that it kind of took a lot of uh, discussion and, and creativity to, to get us there. But I think we all got there together. Thank you. Commissioner Burroughs. Thank you, Mayor. First and foremost, I want to thank everyone who's participating this evening. This is an issue that's of significance to our community. And so thank you, Dr. Corvo. Thank you, Dr. Greiner, and those who are uh, charged with watching over our community. I do have a couple of questions. This goes back kind of what uh, Commissioner Bynum had asked. The, um, we have a mutual aid with our uh, public safety officials and should they have to respond to an incident outside of our community to support a mutual aid are we going to request that they be quarantined or what steps would we take if there was a potential for them to be uh, infected and or come in contact with with someone in an emergency situation and then my, I guess I, my, my second question would be the, uh, the letter, what we're dealing with is we haven't had, quote, an incident with our athletes by this three letter word called yet. And so if we should choose to allow school districts to participate in sports and allow our athletes to do that, there, the, the rumor is, and that's why we're all here this evening, that we're going to ask them to quarantine and the cohorting comes into play. And this goes back to question number one. But when we have those incidents, are we willing to maybe look at a 25-day trial period, a 15-day trial period? In, our schools have the resources in place. The parents have been educated. The students have been educated that this is a, a health issue. And uh, to what extent do, does it come time to let the community and or the parents determine what is best for their families and another elected body to make a decision, that being the school districts. So thank you. I, I know it was a little meshed together, but I wanted to throw that out and Wait, uh, wait your answers. Thank you. Yeah, I think on the on the emergency response issue um, and, and assisting in, in, in other environments, um, we, we would we would hope and I think this has been true in healthcare that that those folks would be be utilizing personal protective equipment. I think our, our police force and, and, and firefighters and others have we've worked a ton with them and, and they, they know how to use personal protective equipment. They know that they, they probably should use it universally. They should just assume everyone they interface with has COVID. They've been doing that in the county. So I think we would assume if they went out of county, they would do that too. And, and so they would not have to quarantine coming back in because they're, they're, they're using PPE. In fact, in the healthcare environment, right? If you, I've seen COVID patients myself, right? And, and if I have the, the appropriate protection on, then I'm not required to go into quarantine, even if I spent 30 minutes in, exam, in an exam room with that patient. Um, that, that sounds probably hypocritical to people, but that's, that's the way healthcare entities all over the country are working um, right now. I think, I think in terms of, of say a, a community decision and, and, a, and a 25 day trial period, I think we are seeing some interesting things in, in, some, in some settings, say with professional sports, for example, with with professional baseball, professional football, there's a ton of resources getting 
poured into those trials and lots and lots of testing and lots and lots of work on cohorting that group of individuals, whether it's the coaches or the teams. I think, you know, if we were going to try something and I, and I, you know, we're always open to innovative, creative things. It's, it's a resource issue to some extent too. what, what you can safely pull off and, and protect everybody involved when you, when you're trying something out that, that might lead to cases and, and, and spread beyond a small group. Uh, thank you for that, Dr. Greiner. Again, this is Commissioner Burroughs. Uh, I would just state that I don't believe there's one elected official in our community or statewide for that matter, that wants to put our children at risk. And this, this is an issue that is of much importance to the families in our community, as well as across the state. I think there's the, the real issue is here, are we treating our kids in a punitive manner or is the message all wrong? I mean, I value each and every life in our community and I know the parents are struggling and I know the students are struggling. We need answers and the medical answers we're getting may not suffice enough. It may be as a community and the, as was stated by Commissioner Ramirez about that communication being critically important. I truly believe that 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 is a great assistance in resolving these issues. This pandemic has allowed a lot of us to reconsider how we want to lead this community. And I respect the work that all of the health professionals are providing us and the guidance they're providing us. But at some point, we have to also provide the mental health aspect that this pandemic is causing. We have to recognize that. And it, that, that can come into play also. And this, the, the approach of the parents wanting these students to participate in sports, I can understand and appreciate. It's not just sports, it's, it's other events, whether it be the arts, musical events, whatever it may be. But the education aspect through our educational community, I truly trust that they are doing all they can to protect their kids. I don't believe there's an elected school board member that wants to see any of our kids infected. And so I, I, will leave the, I will leave this with you, Dr. Greiner and Dr. Corvo. We need, we need some assistance here as a community to find a resolve that's not punitive, but that is understandable and offers a safeguard without being heavy handed. And that is a fine line to walk. I value each and every one of you, and I value each and every one of the children in this community. And like many of the other elected leaders that are here this evening, if, if we could all be king for a day, how would we solve it? I don't want to be king for a day, but I do want to be part of a community that understands and respects and values each and every one of us. So again, thank you for the opportunity to visit with you on this issue, and I sincerely respect and appreciate what information you're providing us this evening. Um, Dr. Corvo, I want to go back to the, uh, the, the, the process of cohorting. And I know that this has been widely adopted by schools across the country. Um, and again, the, the purpose of cohorting is to create a small grouping of 50% of the normal capacity of a classroom. Those students stay with them, stay together all day. They eat together, they take breaks together. Uh, they probably, if they, they don't change classrooms anymore, right? They're because they're having to disinfect the classrooms. And so the, this way, if, if the purpose from the superintendents, the desire of the superintendents, the school board, and I hear this from so many people is we really want to get back to school. And so working with the superintendents you have come up with this and others have come up with this process of cohorting that does not in fact eliminate all spread because we're not, we're not talking about eliminating all spread. But what we're saying is if a student were to come into the classroom, and again, anywhere from 40 to 45% of the people with the virus are asymptomatic, don't even know they have the virus. So a kid comes to school with the virus we, we, they wear masks in class, they social distance, they sanitize all the surfaces to reduce the risk, but it's very possible that that virus could be still be spread. We know that. And so that cohort then, if we do come up with a positive, that cohort can then be quarantined for 14 days 
in order to prevent the spread to the other cohorts. That's correct, Mayor. Yes, yes, we, again, are, are just trying really hard to keep as, as many kids as possible in, in school. And I, I wanna get back to, you know, part, partly what you, you, you're talking about and the, the importance of this, but also Commissioner Burroughs' uh, comments, I think um, were important. Um, I, I want to emphasize that um, these are really difficult times for us to to think about what to do next. You know, to to keep everyone as as safe as possible, and um, also, you know, of course, there there are a lot of loud voices right now on on this issue, um, and, and I think there are also probably just as many voices that are not as loud that are, are afraid. And we talk to a lot of those people in in private and receive emails from, from them as well. I'm sure many of you do too, but yes. I, I want to say that I, I, it is a fine line and I, you know, we don't want to take hope away from our young people. I mean, I, I it, we, we actually really just want to prioritize, I guess, the in classroom learning and, and allow them to receive their education. And, and we have prioritized that over over other extracurricular activities at this point. Although I realize that extracurriculars and sports uh, is learning in and of itself and, and extremely important for development of our kids. So, yes. so I get so, all of that. We're just having a rough time with how, yeah. to, how to balance that, you know. I understand. And, and, and so the, the point I think uh, that I'm taking from this is when, uh, whether it, it people go outside and, and they, they play in close contact, uh, is there any evidence that close contact does not result, cannot result in infection? Uh, if the two people are not infected, <laughs> I, I think that, um, yeah. I think that the reduction uh, in, in that spread when people are in close contact is is impressive when we wear masks. There yeah. is evidence to show that when we're in cloth masks, I think the reduction is, you know, 30 to 40 percent. If we're in paper masks and they're not, they, they're not, as we say, sweat through or soiled, you know, probably get a reduction of about 65 percent or so of that spread, you know, and those N95s are really the way to go. You know, we get 95 percent sure. reduction. And so, yeah, that that's really it. So that's, I mean, we're trying really oh to just decrease that chance. So again, I guess my point I'm trying to make is there is there is evidence. In fact, we have had infections within Wyandotte County athletic activities. You mentioned yeah. the, uh, the volleyball club. So there have been yes. infections to do that. Um, so there is evidence and more and more evidence that close contact and athletic activities do spread the virus, but there is absolutely no evidence that it does not spread the virus. I wanna be clear about that. Correct. I would like to say that uh, need to say that these measures that we're putting in place are always about trying to protect and that uh, what we've seen is all these measures are incremental. No one thing does it completely. Um, and even when a stay at home order, there is still transmission because people still have to go out for essentials. Um, but we want to make sure we don't have to go back to that. And we're going to do whatever we can to stop the spread as much as possible. And yet you're trying to balance that with getting kids back into school for in, in classroom instruction, which is very important. So that's the primary goal. And we can't sacrifice that for, for other things. Um, I would like to say, I've heard the same thing that Commissioner Kane has heard um, that you know, we're, we're dictating. And you know, having been uh, the disciplinarian at a high school and a teacher and a coach, it's all about dictating. It's all about saying, you will do this, you will not do this. And you do that because there is a greater vision uh, at stake. You are saying, this is who we want to become. This is what we want to become. And so in order for us to become this, we must do these things. We must not do these other things. It's all about dictating. Football itself dictates everything. 100 yards by 40 yards, four downs, four quarters. Uh, you know, it's, it's all dictation. There are limits. That's how the game is played. That's really where the, the glory of the game is comes out. We, I think also we have to keep in mind 
if we weren't talking about COVID, we'd be talking about concussions. And the amount of resources that schools have put in to mitigate concussions and how that has changed the face of, of football and other sports is astounding. And so what we were willing to do to stem concussions for the long-term damage that brings to, to children, um, we also have to do for this. And if, if, we, if we keep that in mind that we dictate, you cannot rough the passer. You, you cannot uh, take the, 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 the quarterback to the ground and pound him to the ground. That's dictated. You cannot do that. And that's simply done for safety. We're not just talking about the kids in, in the classroom. We're also talking about their teachers. We're talking about staff. We're talking about administrators. And of course, we're talking about the community at large. And, you know, I think about this. If, uh, if I, I, you know, as dean of students, one of my responsibilities was to handle all the security for all the athletic events. And when we start, first obtained lightning detectors, we had a game with 7,000 people in attendance, a very important playoff game. And both teams were ready to go. They started the game. We had the lightning detector. We started seeing the lightning move closer and closer. And we had to move to the place where we had to evacuate and cancel that game. That was not a punishment. That is a consequence. I think people have to be clear. There are consequences, natural consequences of actions, and there are punishments. Telling people that they cannot engage in close contact is not a punitive measure. It is simply a safety measure that is a consequence of a virus. So I wanna go right now to this. The enemy here is not our public health department. It is not the elected officials. It is not administrators. It is the virus. The virus is going to do what the virus wants to do. What we must do is pay attention to the virus, discover what it is, how it moves, what its effects are, and decide what we can do to stop that. Every time we veer off of that, every time we take our eye off the virus, we lose track of what we're about because the virus is dictating to us. And if we don't dictate to the virus, it will take us where we don't wanna go. And we've seen that time again. I think of my own mother again, who has not been able to come out of the building since March 15th. That was not punishment. That is a consequence. And finally, you know, the, the mental health. Having worked in schools, high schools, for 31 of my professional years, I understand very well how important athletics are to the individual student, to the family, to the community, to the school. It's, it's clear to me and everything we need to do to try and make that happen needs to happen. But we would never sacrifice, I would never have allowed the game to go on with lightning coming in. I was not gonna be that person who was gonna to have to answer the question, why did you not evacuate the stands? Why did you keep playing this game and people died? When you had the power and the authority to do it, you did not stop it. Not one of us, I don't care if, whether it's the governor, the president, the, the health department, uh, an administrator, a teacher, a coach wants to say, I could have done something to stop death and I did not do it. So I'm very passionate about this because we have to look at the virus. The virus is kicking us. Stop arguing with one another. Stop complaining about the measures that are taken. Stop complaining about masks. Stop complaining about having to slow down. If we do what we need to do to slow the virus, we take control and not let the virus control us. So having said on that, um, I think it's time for us to move to our next topic in the, in the on, on, or on three. Uh, Doug, how much time do we need for this next? Mayor, I would say it'll probably take 45 to 50 minutes at least to go through it. I believe the presentation runs a good half hour plus to move through this. So, um, and I figured there'll be some Q&A after that. Okay, well, I'm going to, uh, uh, we have one more. Uh, Commissioner Burroughs, we got a brief comment and then we'll go on to the next uh, topic. Thank you, Mayor, and, and I appreciate your comments. I, I would just like to, I think it's important that we let the community know where we are tonight on this issue. Uh, has anything changed? Is there any proposed changes coming? I think it's important that they have an opportunity to, to know where we are this evening. Well, I can probably just leave it with, there is no change 
from what has come out this evening. I believe from the information our doctors presented, they are continuing to evaluate the situation and review it. And, you know, there's been changes that have come across over the last five months. So there could be things that could come back for additional discussion on it, but there is no change made to any rules or orders that are in place today. Thank you. All right, we'll go on now to the uh, next item for consideration, a presentation regarding the Central Avenue Master Plan. Thank you, Drs. Corvo and Greiner and Julianne Van Lu. Thank you. All right, Mayor, so this next item, as you said, is regarding the Central Area Master Plan. Um, we have uh, been working on this for some time, and I'm going to turn this over to our planning department. We have Kim Porti with our planning staff and Jamie Granger, who is our consultant with Interface Studios, who are going to do the presentation tonight. Um, Kim, are you going to take it from here? I'll take it from here. Good evening, everyone. Good to see you all. I hope everyone's doing well. Yeah, so we have been working on the Central Area Master Plan for the last year. We are getting close to wrapping it up and we're in the final stages. Um, the hot topic COVID did throw us off a little bit with our public engagement. So just as we were about to engage in our final public meeting, the COVID started happening. So we moved to an online presence where we started doing online public engagement. We actually had some pretty good interaction on that. And now we are moving on to the steps of putting together the draft plan, getting input, and then moving on to putting together the final master plan. So Jamie with Interface Studios has some um, updates and presentation for you guys. And we really wanna get your input on where this is going, if it's the direction that you expect it to be in, and if the implementation items are things that you agree with and all of that. So I'll turn it over to Jamie. Okay, thank you, Kim. Um, I appreciate everyone taking the time and allowing me to, to you know, present tonight. I understand a planning process can seem trivial, you know, with everything kind of going on in the world, um, but, you know, appreciate you uh, allotting me this opportunity to share the process. Um, I'm going to share my screen real quick. Is everyone able to uh, see the screen? Kim, can you give me a thumbs up? Okay. Um, so I know some of you have been involved in the process, uh, others haven't. Um, we shared with you a draft. I fully understand that, um, you know, it, probably everyone hasn't got a chance to read it. <laughs> so hopefully we're gonna share some of the, you know, a little bit about the process and some of the recommendations and hopefully get some of your feedback. Um, when we're talking about the central area, it's really this area to the southwest of downtown, bounded by 635 and 70, um, and then the northern border being State and Armstrong and, and downtown being kind of cut out um, from that area. Um, but really this is a collection of uh, smaller neighborhoods, um, all with kind of their unique, you know, uh, their own and unique identity. Um, we got the opportunity to meet with all these neighborhood organizations and they were involved in the process. Um, I won't dwell on this too long as, as Kim kind of touched about on this. We started about um, probably a year ago towards the end of last summer, really in earnest. We're gearing up towards a, uh, a spring completion. Obviously things changed. We had to change course, um, but now um, we, as we've developed a draft plan, we've been sharing it with either uh, the planning commission, um, variety of UG departments, um, our steering committee, all trying to get feedback, um, going to take a lot of that feedback and really uh, come up with a final plan that will eventually be uh, voted on. Um, just a little bit about our process. Uh, <clears throat> it's really community and data driven. Um, we try to get as much input from the community as possible, do a lot of research and analysis, and really the combination of those two really leads to a vision and recommendations and ultimately some strategies. Um, in regards to outreach, uh, we tried to um, reach as many people in a variety of different ways. Um, we did that through individual interviews, um, variety of public events. Um, we had a presence at some larger parades. 
Um, we met with all the neighborhood meetings, some multiple times. Um, we had some focus groups about some key topics. And then uh, as COVID happened, we transitioned a lot of the, the RH to on, an online survey and we got some great input from that um, as well. Um, just some bigger uh, topics and, and things that we've heard from that outreach process. Um, you know, we asked a series of questions um, across all of this outreach. Um, one of which being, what are the things you value most about the neighborhood? Um, the number one response being the community, second being uh, diversity, and then third being businesses and restaurants. Um, and then a more kind of forward thinking question about what do you want the central area to be in the future? Um, the top two answers were a welcoming community and a clean and well-maintained community. Um, in regards to you know, a lot of the research that we did to supplement the, that outreach, there are a few other key factors that we determined that were important. Um, the central area is uh, a lower income community um, compared to both the, the um, city at large and the state. Um, so, you know, there's obviously consequences uh, to deal with that. Um, people really love their homes, but there's concern about affordability and maintenance. Um, there's a desire to change the mobility status quo. Um, I think 93% of residents um, commute to work by car, according to the census. Um, Central Avenue plays a central role in the community. You know, there's a variety of different commercial corridors but Central is really that one that kind of connects all these different neighborhoods. Um, and then also that parks are an important community gathering places that could use some upgrades. Um, we kind of took all of that information and developed a, a vision supported by uh, four separate goals. Um, the four goals being around Central Avenue specifically, um, about housing, some about mobility, and another about community. Um, and I'll go into each one of these specifically with a little more detail. Um, so the, the first goal is to establish Central Avenue as a social, cultural, and employment center of the neighborhood. Um, <clears throat> there's a few different strategies associated with that. The first being to create a place on Central Avenue through physical improvements. Um, the second is to leverage the diversity um, to create a unique identity and market opportunity. And then the third being ongoing resources for existing businesses. Um, so one of the first, uh, I'll walk you through a few of the action items. Um, I probably don't have time to go through uh, all of them. So I called out just a few important ones. Um, first one being the idea around redesigning Central Avenue and key locations. Um, we see really kind of four areas that will benefit from this the most. It's really the areas that have the highest concentration of businesses. Um, one of which is kind of the changes to the street have already happened. It's really that Eastern side, um, East of 7th around Slaps and Split Block Coffee. Um, there used to be a turn lane down the middle uh, that was removed and angle parking was introduced. Uh, you know, it slowed down traffic. It's, it's uh, increased the amount of parking spaces, um, added some pedestrian amenities. Um, you know, I don't think it's uh, a coincidence that a lot of the investment that's taken place on Central happened in that location. Um, but in the majority of the stretch of Central looks something like this. Um, it's got a continuous turn lane, faster moving cars, um, limited parking. Um, so the idea that came up through the process and was really to kind of reintroduce um, that condition that happens on the eastern end across um, the Central Avenue corridor and some of those key locations. Um, this will help support businesses with additional parking, improve uh, pedestrian access, and all of these things that kind of came out of the process. Um, so in just thinking about what this could physically look like, this is just uh, west of 7th. Um, you can see how it, it kind of really impacts the neighborhood in that particular stretch. Um, adds significant amount of new parking, and it really just uh, creates more of a commercial vibe on, on Central Avenue that's that's currently uh, not existing. Um, another action item is about improve some of these pocket parks. Uh, Central Avenue cuts at an interesting angle and leaves these kind of leftover spaces. One more prominent is 18th and Central. Really heard a lot in the process about how this is really um, critical. Uh, intersection. It's really the start of the, the corridor, the commercial section of the corridor. There were some recent 
uh, investments that have been done to truncate Park Drive, but can we kind of reallocate some of that parking space and really make this more of a community gathering space? Um, in addition to 18th and Central, there's some other gateway opportunities that can really um, welcome people to the corridor and really build off of its uh, identity. Um, one being uh, the far eastern side. You know, this is a, really a first impression a lot of people get of Central Ave and and even Kansas. Um, so how can we really make it uh, more engaging that really reflects um, the unique identity on Central Ave? Um, and this is something that can be done, uh, the design process of this can be done in coordination with businesses and residents to really determine something that's fitting for the corridor. Um, we also see a big opportunity around La Placita um, food market, which takes place in Bethany Park. There's a variety of different um, programming events that happen on the corridor, but La Placita probably has the most potential to really bring people um, back to the corridor on a reoccurring basis. Um, and it also really plays off a lot of the strengths uh, within the central area being its diversity, um, the diverse food that takes place. Um, and in times of COVID, it, it, there's also an, act, an opportunity to really provide uh, healthy food options for uh, residents and really a socially distanced area. So, it, you know, it's something that um, can uh, be improved on. When asked specifically, um, residents identified a, kind of a permanent presence within Bethany to help support the uh, market, either through a market shed or something similar. So that's something uh, to consider as well. Um, and this is just a, you know, how a lot of these um, strategies could kind of play out and really make a unique space on Central Ave. We asked specifically, you know, if there's one place residents would want to invest on Central, where would it be? And it's really that stretch between 13th and 18th. Um, so that, you know, when we start thinking about implementation, um, focusing on that area makes a lot of sense. Um, the second goal is to provide housing as suitable for a range of life stages and economic circumstances. Um, strategies being to provide support and resources for existing homeowners and also to add to the housing stock to diversify options and support broader community goals. Um, something that came up in the process um, was code enforcement and kind of maintenance of housing. Um, through our analysis portion of of the planning process, we did a block by block survey of the block condition, um, took into account things like vacancy or maintenance, um, and really broke it up into areas that were trending up or places that were trending down. Um, so by targeting some of the code enforcement of the areas that are trending down, um, all of it done in coordination with resident input in that uh, residents are really the eyes and ears of the community, um, and they can help code enforcement really make a distinction between, an, you know, an elderly individual who can't maintain their house versus an absentee landlord. Um, you know, and that's an important distinction to make. Um, another issue that came up is is the challenges with home repair. Um, you know, it's a, an older housing stock. A lot of residents have issues maintaining their houses. There are a variety of different programs that exist um, that kind of prevent uh, houses from becoming vacant. You know, there's a process in that a uh, small maintenance issue turns into a large issue and then ultimately the, the building's abandoned. Um, and then the unified government has to deal with it kind of on the tail end um, through uh, rehabilitation or demolition or some of those other tools that exist. So are there opportunities going to interject earlier on in the process? Um, this is something that came up in the Northeast area master plan as well. So it kind of lends to a, a broader citywide um, opportunity to address some of those issues and help residents. Um, in terms of new housing, uh, we see there an oppor uh, opportunity with a, really an infill housing strategy. And when we say that, um, it's really looking to lower the barriers of entry to, for development and, and costs and some of those five stages associated with development. Um, there's a big opportunity just due to the fact that the land bank owns a significant amount of holdings in the central area. So some of those costs can be lowered. Um, there's opportunities for pre-approved blueprints or relationship with contractors, all of those things that can bring new housing to market at a lower cost. Um, and there's also partnerships to be made kind of on that fifth 
um, section as well about um, developers who have a different business model, not necessarily profit driven um, and, and coordinating with them. Um, CHWC already does a lot of work within the central area. Um, and then finally in this section is codifying some of the zoning of major parcels. Um, concurrently with our process, the city's also been updating the zoning code. So it's important that some of the zoning changes really reflect um, the community's desire for some of these larger development sites. Um, Seventh and Central is an obvious one that came up throughout the process and that it sits just adjacent to a lot of the good activity that's been going on in um, on the eastern end of Central. Um, so it can, you know, the, the regulations that exist really build off of that um, the, you know, good work that's already and investments that have already been done. Um, obviously, this is a, a privately owned parcel, so there's only so much control. Um, but inevitably, it's if the developer would need to come to the city for something, having these a vision for the site and the zoning to back it up um, is an important step. Some of the other uh, sites that came up are the Bethany Hosp former Bethany Hospital site, as well as the Alcott Arts um, site. So, you know, part those are in a way more challenging sites and there's a lot of moving parts. Um, but I think through this process, we started um, levels of communication with all those involved um, that will uh, you know, be, be involved as those developments uh, take place and make sure you know, they're addressing uh, the community needs. Um, the third goal is to design a mobility network that gives options and promotes a sense of community. Um, the first strategy is to improve the comfort and safety of the pedestrian network, develop a bike and trail network, and then increase transit and shared mobility ridership to improve connections. Um, you know, an integral piece of uh, a real pedestrian network is our sidewalks. Um, many streets within the central are lacking sidewalks. Um, so in an ideal world, every street would have, would get a new sidewalk, but you know, it's the financial um, realities kind of are up, that we're up against in, in doing something like that. So it, we took the approach of really focusing on some of the streets that would benefit the most because they have access to a lot of different um, institutions and things that residents value or be walking to either a business or a park entrance or a school, a church, all of those things. And where can we kind of concentrate resources? Um, and as specifically, residents really called out um, those sidewalks adjacent to streets. Uh, so calling out specific routes to streets um, where some of that targeted investment can take place. Um, it's, it's, some of the major north-south um, streets within the corridor are, are significant barriers for residents crossing east-west. Um, if you look at this map, this calls out 18th, 10th, 7th, and 6th. Um, the square box is being intersections with crosswalks. You can see in 18th, there's, you know, it's, it is a wide street, but it's, there are opportunities to cross. But when you look at places like 10th, you have to walk almost two thirds of a mile before you get to a designated crosswalk. So, you know, these are serious impediments to a, a safe pedestrian network for residents. Um, residents really, uh, had a strong desire to improve upon the existing bike network and really provide, um, you know, ensure that this plan calls out um, improved infrastructure. So really people would feel safe um, biking through the central area and an interconnected network. Um, the existing bike lanes on 10th and there's some in, in lane sharrows on central. Um, you know, this is an ideal, uh, network that would most likely be built up over time. And this really builds off of the sidewalk and trail master plan as kind of a base. Um, but there's some opportunities uh, to uh, extend the existing network and really make some other strong connections, particularly to the river um, that came up through the process as well, and tap into some of the larger trail network um, that's that takes place throughout the city and the region. Um, Residents called out Minnesota as one uh, earlier implementation piece, and and you know there's just a graphic of what something like that could look like. This is at the near the 18th and cent or Minnesota intersection. Um, part of that has to do with Minnesota is such a wide street that you could 
uh, install bike infrastructure without really changing the, the main dynamics of the street. Um, and then more of a, an immediate implementation piece, the Unified Government's working on a bike share um, program. Um, and there's, you know, there's an opportunity to install bike share um, locations throughout the central area, um, particularly on Central, um, Central Avenue. Um, and when you, you know, look at the, it, it makes a lot of sense to install where the existing bike infrastructure work it already exists. Um, so 10th and Central, it, you know, is an integral piece of that. Um, and then when you, if you tie that in with uh, improved park, uh, uh, investments to parks like Lally Park, um, you can really see how, you know, there's a concentration of investment in, in one place can have a, a broader impact. Um, and then the final goal is to empower residents to build community through shared neighborhood improvements. Um, a first strategy being improve existing green space. Uh, second being beautify neighborhoods and activate underutilized lots. Um, and then finally, create inclusive environments accessible to all. Um, there's a, a variety of planned park improvements uh, that are already existing, um, one being in Clifton Park. Um, so there's an opportunity for that to be really an early stage implementation. Um, and it, it'll address some connectivity issues and some amenities. And something else that came up through the process is uh, the vacant building that exists in Clifton Park and a desire to make that a community amenity. Um, there's a UG program, Stories for Stories, that's working um, to paint the, the building and really draw attention to it. And um, you know that's, that's a good way to kind of start the initial conversation about what a more permanent solution could be. Um, and then Bethany Park came up as well as, as a park that could use some investment as really kind of the central gathering place for the community. Um, there's opportunities to coordinate with the land bank on undevelopable parcels. Um, there you know, are a large number of vacant um, properties within the central area, many of which are uh, owned by the land bank, some of which probably don't have a lot of development potential because of uh, the steep slopes or, or other issues. So what is the, really the long-term solution for what some of those parcels are? So you know, there's an opportunity for the land bank to start that conversation with resident organizations about um, you know, turning some of those spaces into assets, either through programmed gardens or return them to kind of a natural state, whatever it is um, that can really help support uh, the community. Um, and then finally, you know, the, this really touches on one of the, you know, the, the number one thing that residents talk about is they value community. Um, which is always a challenge in, in such a diverse place uh, as the central area. Um, and there are some large scale events that bring people from all over to the central area, but uh, there was really a desire for some of these smaller scale neighborhood events, things like community dinners, block parties, um, interfaith gatherings, all of these things that provide a more intimate setting that allows residents to really interact and, and socialize. Um, so there's strategies around that as well. Um, so again, I'm just going to, you know, come back to where we started. Um, we really have the draft plan. Um, hopefully you've all been able to take a look. Um, we originally were planning on the planning commission and you all voting next month, but the timing didn't necessarily work out. So we actually have two months, um, to work through edits, um, throughout the process. Um, Hopefully we'll, we have a little bit of time for um, some questions and comments uh, this evening. If not, you know, within that time frame, uh, we're extremely welcoming uh, comments either through email or you can get in touch with any of us. Um, really just general comments. Um, it would be helpful for us to know if there's something uh, you're adamantly opposed to, um, so we can kind of tweak that, uh, or if there's uh, things that you think are missing. Um, and then also, are there opportunities to uh, learn a little bit more about potential opportunities for implementation, um, either through partnerships or funding? Um, so again, I, I thank you for allowing me the opportunity to, to speak tonight, and hopefully we can have a little bit of time for discussion. So with that, we'd like to open it up for questions or comments that you guys might have for us. 
Commissioner McKernan. You kind of figured it would be me, didn't you? Hey, I want to say thank you to, to the group. I think that you've done a great job through what about about half a little over halfway through our process. COVID knocked us a little bit off of our trajectory, but I think you've done a great job with staying focused. I really like how you've come up with the goals and the possible possible objectives under that. You've given us a lot to think about, but I think it has really coalesced really well, what I hear anyway, as the priorities of the folks in the various neighborhoods. So I think your goals and your objectives are stretch for us in many ways, but if we can accomplish even some of them, we're gonna have a markedly improved neighborhood or, or central area. And so I just want to confirm now at this point, you're planning to put this draft out online and then gather additional feedback to this. Is that what I heard? Yeah, so the, the draft report has uh, much more information than I shared with you. Um, we gave a similar presentation to the Planning Commission, I guess it was last week or two weeks ago, and got some input. Uh, we uh, gave a presentation to the Steering Committee. Um, which was mostly made up of residents. Um, and then we also, I, I think Kim, maybe you can jump in. I, I think this was put online on the, the website that was set up um, when we kind of uh, changed a lot of our outreach and put a lot, a lot of it online. So there's opportunities um, for residents to engage and provide comment as well. Yeah, we um, met with CABA as well, the Central Avenue Betterment Association. So we pushed it out to their membership um, and then, yeah, we've met with some of the stakeholders and pushed it out that way as well. And then we have it up on our uh, online presence page. Okay, so I did want to clarify one thing. What's out online, because I haven't had a chance to go look at it yet, is it the much longer, more detailed document or is it just this presentation? It's the full draft. Perfect. And there, you know, there are um, some obvious placeholders. Uh, but you know, we'll go through a variety of different revisions in the draft before we come to a, a final draft that will ultimately be voted on. Um, so there, are, you know, there are some things missing. Um, one being the, the update to the land use and zoning is that's kind of still ongoing. Um, but there, you know, there's a lot of information there, more so than than what we discussed tonight. Well, I just want to say very much appreciate your work. You have really given us a, a plan, a document, a goal that if we can move down that road, we're going to make marked improvements in the central area. So thank you. Thanks. Um, Jamie, could you uh, go back, pull up the presentation again, or Kim, whoever has uh, the screen, and go to the, uh, I think the five step process. Uh, I think it might've been the third or fourth slide. Nope, yeah, move forward from that. Um, this? Nope, nope. Um, keep going, keep going. Just go, I can see the side scroll, so go ahead and go, okay. go, back, go back, go back further. Go back to like earlier. Um, okay, I don't know what I'm looking for. Uh, <laughs> Shoot, um, it was the, the five different. Um, Maybe it was this, the key factors. No, it was not that, I'm sorry. Keep going, I'll see if I find otherwise, I'll, I'll have a private conversation with you. But it was uh, the things that are kind of instrumental basically in uh, bringing some new development, uh, the process, it was. Oh, okay, I know what you're talking about. Um, this one. Yes, that one. Thank you. So, um, and the, if you look at the last one, uh, the process takes less time. So that's not a, a, a discrete piece that is describing that if you do all these things, cost associated with development, process takes less time. I think one of the things in here, it's kind of, it's almost included when you say pre-approved blueprints, but um, the, the process during which or in which a developer or rehabber 
works with the unified government, I think is its own cost, especially in terms of time. And I don't know that it's really well uh, described or represented here. And I think we have to really focus on that for our own purposes, because we have to look at that, that whole process from the beginning of, of you know, offering you know, plan review uh, all the way through final inspection. Our part in that can either accelerate or slow down that development. And that when, when it's a slower process, or there are too many obstacles or too many bumps in that process, it discourages new development. So I'm not sure how that could be represented here, but I think we have to represent that simply in order for us to attend to our piece of that, because a lot of this is focused on, uh, you know, what what the, the construction does, what the lenders do, uh, the developer does, but our piece in this, I, I don't see it represented so well. Yeah, I think that's a valid point. And I, you know, the, the challenge um, is that the UG probably is involved in, in most of these steps. <laughs> so, you know, there's, there's an opportunity to rework this graphic to really um, better stress that. Um, but I think the intention of this is that, you know, a lot of these things are kind of already in place. Um, you know, the, the land bank already has, you know, is, is successful, has a, a lot of holdings. Um, there are some already uh, made relationships with contractors and a lot of the rehab. Um, some of the newer things being pre-approved blueprints. See, this is kind of a newer idea that the cities have been taking. Um, and you know, you can, it would require further um, study, um, but to determine, you know, a few different housing typologies that are consistent with the neighborhood that a developer could kind of go to and, and use because, um, you know, at least for small developers, some of those upfront costs are the most um, the di most difficult things and paying for an architect, paying for those things. Um, so really lowering the barriers of entry for that and, and you know, you're allowing more people into the process rather sure. than some, yeah. some of the larger developers um, who have the capital to really deal with some of those upfront costs. Yep. But I think it's a really important point that you may in that yes, the unified government should, you know, should re be re represented more in this graphic and, and we can um, make some adjustments. Yeah, in fact, I, I would say that we probably need to include in there the uh, other development costs such as uh, sewer hookup, water hookup and power hookup, but that's for another conversation. Right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is a, is a very simplified uh, graphic of the actual development I process. Know. I understand, thank you. Commissioner Philbrook. Well, would you put up the um, picture uh, or showing the whole area that's included in this Central Avenue? Thank you, either one of those will work. Okay, so I have a very little bitty bitty part in this and that's just west of 38th Street over to 635 and south of State. And I have really a request, and that is that we move that little section right through there into a State Avenue uh, improvement area because it really is totally different and so different from the rest of that area that I don't think that it can get or has gotten appropriate treatment, okay? Because I already know that one of the biggest complaints is being able to walk from 38th Street West, okay? And I know it's I know it's a quagmire, and I'm not asking for money right now. I'm just saying that I think that that section should be put in a State Avenue improvement sort of thing over where we have it now. That's all. That's just my request because that way, when we look at improvement along State Avenue, we can put that in there too, because there's a lot to be done along there. That's that's my request. Yeah, I mean, that's a, a valid point in that, you know, that that part of our study area is, is so removed from the rest of the neighborhood. Yes. Um, and not many people actually live there, um, at least living people. <laughs> um, 
So yeah, now, it's, now. it's almost its own. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost a, it, its own kind of thing. I think you're exactly right. But that is a walking corridor if they really could walk from there west. Okay, the the only safe way to get there is by car or bus. Right. Areas, and so that makes it really hard on the folks that that take a bus into that point you know or try to take about bus out of that point so i just would ask that it be moved over like i said i'm not asking for money right now i'm just asking it be considered in a different section that's all thanks jamie yeah thanks okay i think that concludes um thank you so much for your presentation we will reconvene at uh seven o'clock all right, thank you all. Thank you.